This is tape one of three tapes on the New Order of Barbarians, referred to on these tapes as simply the New World System. Tapes one and two are reminiscence by Dr. Lawrence Dunnigan of a speech given on March 20th, 1969 by an insider of the order whose names and credentials are given in the interview with Dr. Dunnigan on tape three. The moderator for these tapes is Randy Engel, National Director, U.S. Coalition for Life. There has been much written and much said by some people who have looked at all the changes that have occurred in American society in the past 20 years or so, and who have looked then retrospectively to earlier history of the United States and indeed of the world, and come to the conclusion that there is a that there is a conspiracy of sorts <coughs> which influences indeed controls major historical events not only in the United States but around the world. This conspiratorial interpretation of history is based on people making observations from the outside, gathering evidence, and coming to the conclusion that from the outside they see a conspiracy. Their evidence and conclusion are based on evidence gathered in retrospect, period. I want to now describe what I heard from a speaker in 1969, which in several weeks will now be 20 years ago. The speaker did not speak in terms of retrospect, but rather predicting changes that would be brought about in the future. The speaker was not looking from the outside in, thinking that he saw a conspiracy. Rather, he was on the inside, admitting that indeed there was an organized power force, group of men, who wielded enough influence to determine major events involving countries around the world. And he predicted, or uh, rather expounded on uh, changes that were planned for the remainder of this century. As you listen, if you can recall the situation, at least in the United States in 1969, and the few years thereafter, and then recall the kinds of changes which have occurred between then and now, almost 20 years later. I believe you'll be impressed with the degree to which the things that were planned to be brought about have already been accomplished. Some of the things that uh, were discussed uh, were not intended to be accomplished yet by 1988, uh, but are intended to be accomplished uh, before the end of this century. There is a timetable, and uh, it was during this uh, session that uh, that some of the elements of the timetable were brought out. Uh, anyone who recalls early uh, in the days of the Kennedy presidency, uh, the Kennedy campaign, when he spoke of progress in the decade of the 60s, that was kind of a cliche in those days, the decade of the 60s. Well, by 1969, our speaker was talking about the decade of the 70s, the decade of the 80s, and the decade of the 90s. So that uh, I think that terminology, that way of looking and looking at things and expressing things, probably um, all comes from the same source. Prior to that time, I didn't remember anybody saying the decade of the 40s and the decade of the 50s. So I think this uh, 
overall plan and timetable uh, had taken important shape with more predictability to those who control it uh, sometime in the late 50s. That's speculation on my part. In any event, the speaker said that <clears throat> his purpose was to tell us about changes which would be brought about in the next uh, 30 years or so. So that an entirely new worldwide system would be in operation before the turn of the century. As he put it, uh, we plan to enter the 21st century with a running start. He said as we listened to what he was about to present, he said, some of you will think I'm talking about communism. Well, what I'm talking about is much bigger than communism. Um, at that time, he indicated there is much more cooperation between East and West than most people realize. In his introductory remarks, he commented that uh, he was free to speak at this time. He would not have been able to say what he was about to say even a few years earlier, but he was free to speak at this time because now, and I'm quoting here, everything is in place and nobody can stop us now. That's the end of that quotation. He went on to say that most people don't understand how governments operate, and even people in high positions in governments, including our own, don't really understand how and where decisions are made. He went on to say that um, he went on to say that the people who really influence decisions are names that, for the most part, would be familiar to most of us that he would not use individuals' names or names of any specific organizations, but that if he did, most of the people would be names that were recognized by most uh, of his audience. He went on to say that they were not primarily people in public office, but uh, people of prominence who were primarily known in their uh, private occupations or private positions. The speaker was a doctor of medicine, a former professor at a large Eastern University, and he was addressing a group of doctors of medicine, about 80 in number. Uh, his name would not be widely recognized by anybody likely to hear this, and so there's no point in giving his name. The only purpose in recording this is that uh, it may give a perspective to those who hear it regarding the changes which have already been uh, accomplished in the past 20 years or so, and a bit of a preview to what at least some people are planning for the remainder of this century so that we, or they, would enter the 21st century with a flying start. Some of us may not enter that century. His purpose in telling our group about these changes that were to be brought about uh, was to make it easier for us to adapt to these changes. Indeed, as he quite accurately said, uh, there would be changes that uh, would be very surprising and in some ways uh, difficult for people to accept and he hoped that uh, we as sort of his friends would uh, make the adaptation more easily if we knew somewhat beforehand what, uh, what to expect. Somewhere in the introductory remarks he insisted that nobody have a tape recorder and that nobody take notes which for a professor was a very remarkable kind of thing to uh, expect from an audience. Something in his remarks suggested that uh, there could be negative repercussions against him if, his, if it became widely known uh, what he was 
have to say to to our group, if it became widely known that indeed he had spilled the beans, so to speak. Um, when I first heard that, I thought maybe that was sort of an ego trip, somebody enhancing uh, his own importance. But as the uh, revelations unfolded, I began to understand why he might have had some concern about not having it widely known what was said, although this, although this was a fairly public forum where he was speaking. Remarks were delivered, but nonetheless he asked that uh, no notes be taken, no tape recorder be used, uh, suggesting there might be some personal danger to himself. Uh, if these revelations were uh, widely publicized. Again, as the remarks began to unfold and some of the rather outrageous things that were said at that time, they certainly seemed outrageous, uh, I made it a point to try to remember as much of what he said as I could and during the subsequent weeks and months and years to connect my recollections to simple events around me, uh, both to aid my memory for the future, in case I wanted to do what I'm doing now, record this, and also to uh, try to maintain a perspective on what would be developing if indeed it followed the predicted pattern, which it has. At this point, so that I don't forget to uh, include it later, I just include some statements that were made from time to time throughout the presentation. Um, just having a general bearing on the, the whole presentation. One of the statements was having to do with change. Uh, people get used. The statement was people will have to get used to the idea of change. So used to change that uh, they'll be expecting change. Nothing will be permanent. This often came out in the context of a society of uh, where, where people seem to have no roots or, or moorings uh, but would be passively willing to accept change simply because that was all they had ever known. This was sort of in contrast to uh, generations of people up until this time where certain things you expect to be and remain in place uh, as reference points for your life. So change was to be brought about, change was to be anticipated and expected and accepted, no questions asked. Another comment that was made uh, from time to time during the presentation was people are too trusting. People don't ask the right questions. Sometimes being too trusting was equated with being too dumb. <coughs> but sometimes when, when he would say that and say people don't ask the right questions, uh, it was almost with a sense of regret as if he were uneasy with what uh, he was a part of and wished that uh, people would challenge it and uh, maybe not be so trusting. Another comment that was repeated from time to time, uh, this particularly in relation to changing laws and customs and uh, specific changes. He, he said, everything has two purposes. One is the ostensible purpose, which will make it acceptable to people. And second is the real purpose, uh, which would further the goals of establishing the new system and having it. Frequently, he would say, there's no other way. There's just no other way. This seemed to uh, come as a, sort of an apology, uh, particularly when at the conclusion of uh, describing some particularly offensive changes. For example, uh, the promotion of drug addiction, which we'll get into shortly. He was very active with population control groups, the population control movement, and population control was really the entry point into specifics following the introduction. 
he said the population is growing too fast. Numbers uh, of people living at any one time on the planet must be limited or we will run out of space to live. We will outgrow our food supply and we will overpollute the world with our waste. People won't be allowed to have babies just because they want to or because they are careless. Most families would be limited to two. Some people would be allowed only one and the outstanding person or persons might be selected uh, and allowed to have three, but most people would allow to have uh, only two babies. That's because the zero population growth uh, is 2.1 children per completed family, so something like every tenth family might be allowed the privilege of the third baby. To me, up to this point, the word population control uh, primarily connoted uh, limiting the number of babies to be born, but uh, this remark about what people would be allowed and then what followed made it quite clear that when you hear population control, that means more than just controlling births. It means control of every endeavor of, an entire, of the entire world population. Uh, a much broader meaning to that term than I had uh, ever attached to it before hearing this. As you listen and reflect back on uh, some of the things you hear, you will begin to uh, recognize how one aspect dovetails with other aspects in terms of controlling human endeavors. Well, from population control, a natural next step then was sex. Uh, he said sex must be separated from reproduction. Sex is too pleasurable and the urges are too strong to expect people to give it up. Chemicals in food and in the water supply to reduce the sex drive are not practical. The strategy then would be not to diminish sex activity, but to increase sex activity but in such a way that people won't be having babies. And the first consideration then uh, here was contraception. Contraception would be uh, very strongly encouraged, uh, and it would be connected so closely in people's minds with sex that they would automatically think contraception when they were thinking or preparing for sex. And contraceptives would be made universally available. Nobody wanting contraception would be uh, find that they were unavailable. Contraceptives would be displayed uh, much more prominently in drugstores and right up with the uh, cigarettes and the chewing gum out in the open rather than hidden under the counter where people would have to ask for them and maybe be embarrassed. This kind of openness was a way of uh, suggesting that uh, contraceptions are Contraceptives are just as much part of life as uh, any other item sold in the store. And contraceptives would be advertised. And contraceptives would be dispensed in the schools in association with sex education. The sex education was to get kids interested early, uh, making the connection between sex and the need for contraception early in their lives, even before they became very active. At this point, I was recalling some of my teachers, particularly in high school, and found it totally unbelievable to think of them agreeing to, much less participating in distributing contraceptives to students. But uh, that only reflected my lack of understanding of how these people operate. It was before the school-based clinic uh, programs got started. Many, many cities in the United States by this time uh, have already set up school-based clinics which uh, are primarily contraception, birth control, population control clinics. The idea then is that the uh, connection between sex and contraception uh, introduced and reinforced in school would carry over into marriage. Indeed, if uh, young people when they matured decided to get married, uh, marriage itself would be uh, diminished in importance. Uh, 
he indicated some recognition that most people probably would want to be married, but that uh, this certainly would not be any longer considered to be necessary uh, for sexual activity. I was surprised then that the next item was abortion, and this, uh, back in 1969, four years before Roe v. Wade, uh, he said abortion will no longer be a crime. Uh, abortion would be accepted as normal and would be paid for by taxes for people who could not pay for their own abortions. Contraceptives would be made available by tax money so that uh, nobody would have to do without contraceptives. If school sex programs would lead to more pregnancies in children, that was really seen as no problem. Uh, parents who think they are opposed to abortion on moral or religious grounds will change their minds when it is their own child who is pregnant. So this will help overcome opposition to abortion. Before long, only a few diehards will still refuse to see abortion as acceptable, and they won't matter anymore. Homosexuality also was to be encouraged. Uh, people will be given permission to be homosexuals. That's what was stated. They won't have to hide it. And elderly people will be encouraged to continue uh, to have active sex lives uh, into the very old ages as long as they can. Uh, everyone will be given permission to have sex to enjoy however they want. Anything goes. This is the way it was put. <coughs> and I remember thinking uh, how arrogant for this individual or whoever he represents to feel that they can give or withhold permission.